first of all, thank you very much for thank giving you. me the opportunity of being here. And then I would like I would like to advise you that um, my presentation is way more informal than my speech. Now I feel that it's probably too informal, but this is because I was explaining my presentation to a friend a couple of days ago, and he said that it was awfully boring. <laughs> so I just tried to improve it while <laughs> using the presentation. But I don't know. <laughs> okay, I will start. Well, in this communication, I will try to show the importance of keep keeping in mind the suffering produced during archaeological fieldwork. I arrived to this topic in a quite silly manner. I had to conduct a semi-structured interview about suffering for my master, and I decided to interview a fellow archaeologist as I am well aware about the suffering that we experience during fieldwork. Once I had finished with the interview, I realized the potential of the topic, but I did not really know how to face it. I had the feeling that some of our suffering is unnecessary and that it was somehow related with our stereotypical ideas about the field and the ideal of field archaeologists. So, I decided to interview 10 archaeologists and ask them about suffering in order to, get, to gather more data. Here, I present the results. I will defend that the suffering that we experience is produced by three main causes. First, because the stereotype of field archaeologist is based on a model of masculinity that no longer represents the majority of those involved in fieldwork. Second, because the dynamics of communication in our excavations tend to fail in showing the volunteers the importance of their work. And third, and finally, because our conception of the field is still based on romantic stereotypes that idealize it but do not represent its reality. In order to reach these results, I have used the suffering that archaeologists experience as an epistemological tool which allows us to notice important problems in our disciplinary practices. This idea of using our own emotions as research tools derived from a very specific model of reflexivity from anthropology, and which is quite different to the majority of reflexive approaches used in archaeology nowadays. To make sense of the information that my interviewees provided me, I read the data through a psychological model of conduct that relates suffering with its deep causes. Finally, and in order to end with something less depressing and more useful, I combine my interviewee's ideas about how to solve suffering with my own. I said that I use our suffering in the field as an epistemological tool to explore some problems in our discipline. But this can raise questions. Is it possible to use our own subjectivity to produce knowledge, especially our own practices? The answer to this question depends on the kind of reflexivity that we use. Reflexivity could be defined as the epistemological vigilance about what we say, why we say it, and which consequences does it have. Reflexivity became widespread in archaeology with the arrival of post-processual archaeologists, which essentially followed Bourdieu's model of reflexivity based on the context of research in a historical, political, and sociological dimension. Following Bourdieu's reflexivity, archaeologists were able to question the discipline, acknowledging its links with colonialism, imperialism, capitalistic ideologies, gender inequality, and so on. All these examples showed that the quest for a neutral and objective science was obstructed by human subjectivity and its inherent biases, which would prevent us from looking at the reality from a neutral position. But there is a problem with this model of reflexivity as it does not account for a fundamental issue in the construction of scientific knowledge. The very fact that knowledge is constructed by emotional beings. In short, it ignores the psychological and introspective dimension of scientific practices. However, in anthropology it has been argued that the psychological states of the researcher are not only an issue to solve a bias, 
but also an epistemological tool to explore the world. This idea is based on the influential book From Anxiety to Method Sorry about the presentation. This idea is based on the influential book From Anxiety to Method by George Devrue. In it, he argues that it is necessary to apply radical empirism in the construction of knowledge. This means that since the emotional influence of the researcher is a necessary condition for any scientific work, especially in the human and behavioral sciences, our methodology should include the monitoring of the researcher's emotions rather than the denial of their existence. I have tried to show that there are real possibilities of using our own emotions to, cost, to construct knowledge, and in particular, to monitor the influence that they have in our methodologies. Now I will try to show the data I obtained through my interviews, and then I will interpret it using psychological models and some feminist perspectives. During the months of November and December of this year, I conducted a small number of 10 ethnographic interviews with archaeologists from different countries. In these interviews, I asked them which kinds of suffering they have experienced during fieldwork, how they think it could be avoided, and what is their idea about the perfect archaeologist. The number of interviews is obviously too low to make any general claim, but their testimonies were useful as a reference about how archaeologists suffer in the field. Regarding the information I obtain, these are the main types of suffering that my informants told me about. Anxiety and security, heart conditions due to uh, external elements, and physical exhaustion because of their hard work. Interestingly, I asked them to rate them in order of importance, and all of them don't play the importance of, the, of working in heart conditions and the physical exhaustion while they all defended that anxiety and insecurity were the more important ones, the ones which produced more suffering. I also asked them about what are the main characteristics that the perfect archaeologist should have. These are the answers that I obtained. Oh, you can see the list there. How is, how is it possible to make sense out of this data? Why is anxiety more harmful than physical exhaustion? And also, how are these kinds of suffering related with being an archaeologist? In order to interpret my data, I have used Davis' model of suffering. He characterized suffering as an emotional distress, a collection of felt experiences ranging from milder forms of anxiety or low mood or unhappiness and sadness to the more serious and debilitating experiences of grief, of grief and what it is clinically called a major depression. His idea of suffering is based in his model of human behavior. According to him, there are two major trends in human behavior, a tendency toward conformity and another one toward realization. On the one hand, the tendency toward conformity accounts for our compulsion to conform to our group in order to obtain ontological security and to reassure our identity. On the other hand, the tendency toward realization is the one that drives us to affirm and assert ourselves by developing and giving expression to our creativity and sense of uniqueness. Following Davis' theory, suffering occurs when we are in situations in which these trends are contradictory or cannot be fulfilled. Through these two trends, I think that it is possible to explain the main dynamics of suffering during archaeological fieldwork. The trend toward conformity is based on successfully adopting the disciplinary practices designed to become a field archaeologist. What I call here disciplinary practices, following Moses' paper from 2007, is the set of activities, beliefs, behaviors and attitudes that tell us what is to be an archaeologist and how to become one. In many cases, I would suggest, disciplinary practices make sense as they are necessary as they are necessary techniques to do fieldwork. But in other cases, these practices are more related with becoming a very specific stereotype of archaeologist and are not only unnecessary but also unfair and discriminatory. The danger of this role model has been showed by ethnographical studies about archaeological practices, 
especially by those from a feminist point of view. The model of archaeologists that we are trying to achieve during our fieldwork is heavily based on Western stereotypes of hegemonic masculinity, according to Moser, another feminist archaeologist. Uh, yeah. The tendency for confirmation can help us to better understand that our anxiety and insecurity are produced because it is difficult to fulfill all the disciplinary practices established to become field archaeologists, as it involves behaving according to this very specific model of conduct that does not represent most of the participants in archaeological fieldwork. When someone does not have the ability to perform according to these standards, he or she does not place the blame into the unfairness of the disciplinary practices, but instead he or she blames him or herself for not being able to behave like a proper archaeologist, and obviously this produces suffering. It is also possible to defend how our tendency for confirmation and our idealization of fieldwork as a romantic activity affected the way that my informants don't play the importance of the suffering produced by hard working conditions and physical exhaustion. The stereotype of archaeologists that my informants define and that we saw at the beginning as an ideal is a romantic character that suffers in the field but does not complain, understanding fieldwork in harsh condition as a kind of rite of passage. We do suffer during fieldwork, but in order to become real archaeologists, we understand it as a key element in the construction of our identity and we accept, and we accept the suffering. Regarding the trend toward realization, it also shows us how our suffering is produced, especially in the case of insecurity and low self-esteem. In our society, individuality, creativity and leadership are very valuable characteristics. When we go to the field, we expect to accomplish goals in order to gain recognition. According to my informants, this recognition can adopt many forms making contacts, obtaining material to publish a paper, becoming part of a well-established team, or even simple things like being recognized as good workers or skillful diggers. But all my informants agreed that recognition rarely arrives. Regarding this point, it was possible to observe the two main tendencies. Among the less experienced diggers, the insecurity was based on the feeling of working without knowing exactly what they were doing, and also because of feeling as expendable members of the team. On the contrary, among veterans, the main obstacle for this tendency to war realization was placed outside the dig itself, and it adopted the form of complaints against the establishment, whether this was academia, political institutions, or yellow peers. Interestingly, experienced diggers tend to suffer due to problems from outside the dig, and they seem to not have great problems regarding the disciplinary practices of being an archaeologist, Perhaps because a great part of them have successfully adopted these practices. Okay. So far, I have tried to show what are the main dynamics of suffering during fieldwork and how we can use this suffering to realize some problems with our disciplinary practices. In the final part of this paper, I would like to discuss a few mechanisms to manage and solve the suffering that we experience during fieldwork. I also asked my informants about how to manage or solve suffering, and I will incorporate their answers to my reasoning. I see two levels of response to archaeological suffering. First, a short-term solution, which seeks to manage individual suffering during fieldwork. Secondly, a long-term solution that consists in a reconfiguration of our disciplinary practices to construct archaeologists through changing our prototypical idea of what an archaeologist should be. This reconfiguration would connect the archaeologist stereotype with the reality of the people who do real fieldwork. All the archaeologists I interviewed had ideas about possible mechanisms to avoid and manage suffering. I have included their ideas in what I call short-term solution. This suffering is derived from our tendency to war realization. My informants defended the utility of improving our dialogical mechanisms within the excavation, as they felt that having the opportunity of talking and being heard 
would not only improve their working conditions but also would positively affect their self-esteem, making them feel as valuable members of their teams. They also offer another, other ideas about how to deal with suffering but without solving its source. To do this, they defended the importance of measures such as doing sportive activities in the afternoons or using relaxation techniques such as yoga. These activities, as you see, are analogous to the stress management mechanisms which are popular in our society and they have proved their usefulness, so they are worth being taken into account. For a long-term solution, this is to solve the suffering derived from the tendency to conformity, it is more complicated but also more important. Using the Bruce reflexivity, I have tried to show how our normative ideas about what is an archaeologist and how to become one do promote inequality and reproduce dangerous stereotypes which produce suffering among those who cannot fulfill them. Our suffering can lead us to construct a new idea about what is to be an archaeologist, an idea which is based in more ethical concerns such as more collaborative and inclusive ways of producing knowledge. I would suggest that the inclusion of people with different kinds of mental or physical health problems in, archaeology, in archaeological fieldwork would help us to learn that our ideas about physical performativity are based on false prerequisites. In the same line, I would argue that we could foment other dynamics of socialization, for example, ones that do not involve uh, alcohol consumption. Finally. The romantic idea about fieldwork is without any doubt related with the general lack of interaction that we archaeologists have with local communities, and if we improve our mechanisms of dialogue with and relation with these communities, the field could become a more human and less exotic place. But I am sure that everybody in this session could think of very interesting ideas to develop better disciplinary practices to become field archaeologists. So please do not hesitate to offer your comments and thank you very much for your attention.